You got a Bible? If you got your Bibles, let's open them up to the book of Matthew. Open them up to the book of Matthew. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I got folks passing out Bibles. If you need to keep that Bible they give you, keep that Bible they give you. Uh, If you need to pass it on to somebody else, take it with you uh, and make sure they get whoever it is you want to give it to gets it. Um, This morning, I've entitled the message. Need one more over here, Jay. Jay, right over here. I got to go hit some. Okay, cool. Um, I've entitled this message this morning, The Most Important Thing. And here's why I've entitled it The Most Important Thing. Because I do believe we're on the prefaces of the end times. I do believe that September is a critical month. I do believe that as believers, we want to be aware and awake to watch this all roll out and to see what God is going to do. But there is something that is the most important thing to every single person in this room. Some of you already know what that is. Some of you, listen think you know what that is, and some of you don't have a clue what that is. But the most important thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, your salvation. Knowing him as Lord and Savior is the only thing uh, that's going to carry you into eternity with God. So it becomes critical to all of us. In the Bible, it's called the good news, and it encompasses many things, uh, many things that the good news of Jesus Christ, many things in the realm of restoration, in the realms of the earth, in the realms of our purpose and destiny, in the realms of history, all of that. But what I'm going to talk about today is the gospel as it pertains to your salvation, your salvation. And I need us, if you could, I need this to be a morning where we get really serious about it. Meaning, I'm not asking for somber faces, I'm asking for true introspection, that you would truly consider what I have to say today, that you could truly consider your standing with God, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Truly consider that, because I believe it's gonna become more and more and more critical in current times for you to know of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I I am a coach, for church planters. These are the pastors that are coming up. Most are young, some are not, but they're entering into the realm of starting churches and building congregations and pouring into people. Uh, And and one of the things that I'm involved in is I travel to a place, whether it be North Carolina or Birmingham or California or or, uh, Missouri, and I meet with these men who are ready to step into that role. And and we go through a week-long process of trying to determine, are they ready? Are they really ready for what's ahead of them? Because most of them don't even know what's ahead of them, but they've got a senior group of guys around them that are pouring into them saying, you got to be ready in this area. You got to know how to do this. You got to be. And one of the areas that I talk to them about specifically is I'll bring them into a one-on-one situation in a room where there's nobody else, just me and that person. And I will say, share the gospel with me. And I want you to know that seven out of 10 don't know how to do it. Seven out of ten will say, well, you got to ask Jesus in your heart. Well, I, I give them this prayer to say, and they don't know the foundation of the gospel of Christ. They don't know the building block of it. Many believers are actually, when we get really, really honest with ourselves, we're afraid to share the gospel. And it's okay to be afraid because there was a time in my life where I was afraid to share the gospel. Why? Because I felt like if I messed it up, it might be their only chance and it would be my fault they didn't get it. By the way, that doesn't work that way, and I'll explain that in a minute. But that's what I thought. Uh, Many don't really understand it themselves. They've had an experience, and it's real. I'm not saying it's not, but then to try to portray it to someone else becomes very difficult. But it's not a formula. That's what I'm saying. It's not a formula, but there is a basic understanding. You have to understand what Christ has done, why you needed it, why another person needed it, in order to be able to express to them why they need this Savior for an eternity with God. And so when you get into that situation, I just want to tell you bluntly, straight up front, come back and tell me when it happens to you. When you get there, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. This is why you don't have to be afraid to share the gospel. Because in that moment, he's going to tell you what that person needs to hear to lead them to Christ. Why? Because he wants them to Christ more than you do. And so he's going to use you to lead them to Christ. And and, and scripture sells it out this way. In Luke 12, 11, it says, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, don't worry about how or what you're going to speak in your defense or what you ought to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you. Now watch. 
in that very hour what you ought to say. I think this is awesome. I think it's awesome because what he's saying is you don't have to go to seminary, you don't have to go to school, you don't have to prep, you don't have to get ready, you don't have to get your index card with your scriptures on it and keep it in your pocket. He's saying don't worry about it, follow me and when you get there I'll tell you what to say. So I can walk into those situations with a great confidence because I know the Holy Spirit wants to lead them to Christ more than I do. So when I open my mouth I say what do you want me to say? Sometimes it's a little different. Sometimes the word choices are a little different. The concept is right. The theology, the doctrine is all there, but he may express it in a different way. So I want to take away that fear from you today, but I want to show you why I'm expressing it this way today, and it's in the book of Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, wait. All right. Matthew 13. A one and a three. Come on, you're on a phone, Barb. Just hit the buttons. Hit the buttons. Okay. (laughs) Matthew 1, 3. I'm going to read 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That day Jesus went out of the house and he was sitting by the sea and a large crowd gathered around him. So he got into the boat and he sat down to the whole crowd standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow seed. And as he sowed, some of the seeds fell by the road. And the birds came and ate them up. And others fell by the rocky places where they didn't have much soil, and immediately they sprung up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on good soil, and they yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Can you imagine being there? Can you imagine being there and Jesus saying, let me tell you about this guy that threw out some seed, it fell on four different kinds of soil, some of them produced, some of them didn't. If you got an ear, hear that. They were like, okay, you want us to be farmers. He goes on to explain. He goes on to explain to his disciples because they come back and say, what was that about? Why do you speak in parables? And he said, I have to because those who are ready to hear this, those who need to hear this, they're going to understand it. And the others aren't. The others aren't. But this parable, they go back and say, would you explain in detail what that means? And I want to show you something, because if you've got a pen or a pencil, get it out and get it ready. If you've got a highlighter on your phone or your iPad, get it ready. There's a few words I'm going to want you to highlight, because I want you to see how this plays out. Matthew 13, 18. Jesus is saying, here then, I'm going to explain to you, here then the parable of the sower. When anyone Here's the word of the kingdom. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the story that allows you to enter the kingdom of God. For anyone who hears the word of the kingdom, now watch these next words, and does not understand it. Please underline understand. And does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches it away, what's been sown in his heart. This is the one whom the seed was sown beside the road. Now the one whom the seed was sown on rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. This is what I want to point out to you. He heard the word, he immediately received it with joy, but do you notice he didn't say he understands it? He said he received it with joy. This is awesome. I get to go to heaven. How cool is that? I I got it. Okay. But he says there's no understanding, and I'll show you why I believe that. 21, yet he has no firm root in himself, but it's only temporary. And when the affliction or persecution rises because of the word, immediately falls away. And then the one whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, again, he does not say understands it, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now watch this last soil. And the one with whom the seed was sown in good soil, by the way, you are the soil, the gospel is the seed. The one who is sown on good soil, this is the man who hears the word and why would he go back and say understands here? Because at first he said, these people hear the word, but they don't understand it. But he makes a point of going back and saying, if it's good soil, they will understand it. They will understand it. Who indeed brings forth fruit, some hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Here is the beauty of this parable. He is saying when we share the gospel, some people aren't going to have a clue. They're just not going to get it. Some people are going to take it, but they're going to take it not from the level of understanding what's happened, from the level of joy. All right. All right. I I get to set free. I get to go to heaven. This is cool. Some people are going to receive it and say, yeah, I'll take that. That should be good to me. But when they're tested and tried, they really didn't understand it. But then he comes back and says, the good soil understands what's going on. 
You know how you know that the good soil understood? It bears fruit. Now, we are not the judge. Let me make that clear. I am not the judge. But I'll tell you this, I look for fruit. I look for fruit. Why do I look for fruit? Because if I can see the fruit, then I know the soil has been planted in and it's bearing. If not, maybe it's time for a clarification in understanding. Oh yeah, I'm a believer. My life is a wreck and a mess. I'm involved in all kind of stuff. I'm not a blessing to anybody, but yeah, I'm a believer. Maybe you didn't understand this. Because when you understand it, fruit begins to bear. I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm not. Please don't walk away from me with that attitude. I'm saying, if Jesus is coming soon, do you understand the gospel? Two reasons. One for you. One for the people you need to share it with before he returns. Let's go through it. It's important that we understand the gospel. You will hear me present the gospel pretty much the same way every time. It is not all inclusive. It is not every single scripture about it in the Bible. It would take hours to present the, uh, the, the gospel if you just went and, and verified everything in scripture. So you will have to go back and verify, but I will give you many scriptures as we go through. To me, the gospel starts with God created you. Why is that important? Because if God did not create you, you're just a moralistic animal. Do you hear what I'm saying? If there's no God, if there's nothing to be accountable to, if there's no God of creation, then we're just an evolved animal who happens to be more moralistic than most. We want to be nice to each other. If you're an um, evolutionist, and you guys have heard me say this before, so I'll say it again for those of you who are new. I'm ready to talk. Here's the reason I'm ready to talk. Because I can understand, I can understand that this hairy thing that was chumped over called an ape loses some of its hair and stands up. That's not a hard stretch for anybody. It seems close, doesn't it? So maybe evolution could be possible. But listen to me. Explain to me why this original amoeba, this original cell, this original thing had life, grows to a certain point and then says, this is the step that I don't think can be explained in evolution, and then says, I have to start a whole different one from me. It has to be different from me. And by the way, once that thing is evolved into different from me, we have to get together in order to produce more. Evolutionary, that doesn't make sense. There's no step in the process that says, I gotta stop reproducing myself, reproduce something different to me that I have to mate with to then to continue the reproduction. Now there's a lot of other creation arguments, but for me, I've just never found an answer to that one. I cannot believe that this is happenstance. I cannot believe that this came together out of the muck and mire or whatever. This is a God creation. It has too much rhythm. It has too much synchronization. It has too much development. It has too much skills. It cannot be happenstance that we're here. God created you. Now, the reason it's important that you know that God created you is because then there's an accountability. There's a God. There's a God who loves you. Why did he create you? Listen to me. He created you because he loves you. I grew up being told God created me for fellowship. That's broke. The reason that's broke is because it would imply that God was lonely and he needed somebody to hang out with. God is not lonely. God didn't create me. Now, does he have fellowship with me since he's created me? Absolutely. Did he create me so that he could have fellowship? No. He created me out of his love. He is a loving, kind, generous, giving God, and he created me so that he could express his love and I could worship him. You think that's arrogant of God? Are you kidding me? He's the only thing you can worship that will not let you down. And so I look back to this God who created me and he says, I gave you a planet. I gave you all of the animals. I gave you the beauty around you. I told you to eat from every single tree out there. You can have dominion over it. You can rule over the animals, over the fish of the sea. It's all yours. Don't eat from this tree. Don't eat from the tree. And it's all good. So here is man enjoying walking with God in the coolness of a day in a creation that God made for him called a garden, getting to eat from every single tree, getting to enjoy, getting to reproduce and multiply, getting to name the animals, getting to enjoy the whole thing with God. And God says, stay loyal. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Don't eat from this tree. Satan enters the scene. Do you remember why Satan left heaven? 
He got kicked out. Why did he get kicked out? He got kicked out because he said, I will be like God. I will ascend to the hill. I will be like him. I will rise myself up. I will be the, I, 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 I want to be like God. Now watch this. That same Satan enters the garden. And what does he say to Eve? Do you want to be like God? See, he starts by saying, did he say you would die? No, you won't die. If you eat from it, you will be like God. That's the driver of Satan the whole time. He wants to be God. He wants to be God of you. He wants you to choose whether he's going to be your God or God's going to be your God. So he goes into Eve and says, no, you're not going to die. He's not telling you the truth. What's really going to happen is you're going to be like God because that's the goal here. Be like God. And Eve is deceived. Deceived past the point of what God told her to do, which is don't eat that. And she does. And so does Adam, who was with her. Read the scripture. She didn't do it and then go find Adam in the garden and say, hey, you want to try this? Scripture says he was with her. So they broke that relationship with God. Now I have God who has created this earth, created it for me, created it with dominion for me, gave me all kind of blessing, walked me through good, loving on me, loving on me, loving on me, loving on me, and just says stay loyal, and we choose to follow Satan. There's a treason that's happened. There's a mutiny that happens. Sin enters the world. What is sin? It's the disobedience to God. So now there's something new. Sin brings all kind of chaos into the world because everything that God created is under God's control the way God designed it. When we sin, we break that system of God relationship and we allow death in, we allow corruption in, we allow deceit in, we allow lying in, we allow death in. It becomes a mess. It becomes a mess, but it was our choice. And and we end up with this separation from God. How do I know that? Because scripture says God drove them out of the garden. He said, you've shown loyalty to the God of this earth instead of me. And so what I created for you, I have to push you out of. So you'll need to leave. And the separation begins in Genesis 1.24. But listen to me, God is not flesh and blood. God is spirit. So a lot of people get confused by, well, he said they would die if they ate from that tree and they didn't actually die. So what happened? Because death is spiritual. Spiritual death is separation from God. I don't get to be with God. That's eternal death for me. That's an eternal separation. And he's saying, if you choose the God of this world, you will be separated from me. And death will come into the world. Decay, deterioration, everything that comes with it. But the death that he's talking about here is the death in the relationship with you and him. You'll be separated out of the garden, out of his care. So man has to move out of that garden. And Satan then becomes the one who has, watch, dominion over the earth. Why? Because God gave it to man and man gave it to Satan. He said, I won't follow God now, I'll follow you. So now you have dominion over the earth. So now Satan gets to rule and reign on the earth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says he's the God of this world. John 12.31 says he is the ruler of this world. But let me show you the beauty of God. This God who loves you so much. Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they hid. Why did they hide? Because of shame, because they were busted, because their disobedience was now known. And God says, I don't want you to feel naked. I'm going to make you animal skin coverings. You think, what's the big deal? They went from fig leaves to animal skins. A sacrifice was made to cover their nakedness. A sacrifice of an animal was made to cover their shame, to cover their disobedience. So they leave the garden clothed with what Adam gave it. And and God begins at that very moment a process of restoring the relationship. He goes to Adam and Eve and says, what did you do? Did you eat from it? All right. Then Satan, her seed is going to produce one that will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, but you will crush your head. And God puts in place at that very moment the process of restoring that relationship between God and man. He wants us back in the garden. He wants us back in relationship with him. He does not want to be separated from him. But God, concept a lot of people don't want to grab a hold of, God must punish sin. He has to. He has to. 
There's something he has to have grace on. It's our sin. But the sin has to be taken care of. Romans 1.8 says it this way. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So there is a right and a wrong. And when it's wrong, then God has to deal with that. But God loves you. And so God is making a way when you disobey, which he's going to tell us later we all do, how to be reconciled to him. If I'm a parent and I allow one of my daughters to get away with whatever she wants and do not do anything about it, and the other daughter does the same thing and I punish her, am I fair? Am I just? Is that grace? It's not even grace because it's unjust. It's because I'm partially doling out some for this one and not for that one. And what he's saying is sin is sin. Whether you ate from a single tree or whether you're sleeping with somebody else's wife, sin is sin and it's going to be dealt with in some way. So God sets up a system. For many people, this is where it gets really awkward. It gets really weird, but when you understand the symbolism, it's no longer awkward and weird. He says, look, I will give you a set of rules to live by. You will know what is right and you will know what is wrong. And when you do something wrong, this is what I want you to do. I want you to find an animal needs to be a one-year-old lamb, needs to be spotless, no issues with it at all. I want you to lay your hand on it, and I want you to say, I transfer my sin onto this animal, and then I want you to kill the animal, and I want you to sacrifice it. And we say, wow, that's just gory. That's just brutal. But you have to remember, this is about symbolism. This is about something he's trying to show us and something he's trying to teach us. So God, full of grace and love for you and wanting to restore the relationship with you, sends Jesus. To be what? That animal for us. He becomes the lamb of God. The one who gets to take on my sin and be put to death with it. John 3.16, which Jan talked about earlier. Because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He gave him to take on your sin so that you didn't have to bear the punishment of that sin. Jesus becomes a man. Why does he become a man? He becomes a man because it was man who gave dominion to Satan, and it's man who's going to have to take it back. So he comes as a man into this world to take that dominion back. And the beauty of it is, and I get get kind of semi-harassed for this, but I'm going to keep saying it because I can defend it. If Jesus had come to this earth and sinned, God punishes all sin. He would have had to have been punished just like me for my sin. He would have had to be separated from God just like me because of my sin. If he had sinned, you say, well, Jesus can't sin. Listen, he came as a man. It says he was tempted the same as you and I, yet without sin. Why would that scripture be in there if it wasn't possible? Okay, so Jesus doesn't sin. Why is that important to you and me? Because at the end, he's ready to go to heaven. He can die physically here and go straight to heaven, but he doesn't do it. He becomes a substitute for me. I symbolically lay my hand on Jesus. He takes my sin and he takes the punishment for it. Why? Because he never sinned. So he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become righteous, right with God, in him. Because of him, I get righteousness with God. So in the crucifixion, he dies and goes through the separation. And you say, well, when did he get separated? When he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because God is pouring out the cup of wrath, the punishment on sin on him. Listen, if if, if that concept's a little foreign to you, remember in the garden, Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. What did Jesus not want to endure? The wrath of God against the sin of all man. He said, "If if there's any other way to do this than taking this wrath from you. If you go into your Bibles, Jeremiah 25, 15, Revelation 14, 10, Revelation 16, 19. Yes, I'll send you my notes if you send me an email. All talk about the cup of wrath that God has. That he has a cup of wrath that is going to get poured out. So Jesus dies on the cross, takes that punishment. Now watch. I'm going to take you back to the Israelites in Egypt. When they're enslaved. And God says, I'm going to send a savior named Moses who's going to take you out and lead you to a promised land. Physical picture, spiritual concept in the New Testament. But he goes and he says, take a lamb. 
slaughter that lamb, and then take the blood from that lamb and put it on the doorpost of your house. Because tonight I'm sending a death angel through. And when that death angel comes through, if he sees a blood covering on your house, he's going to pass by and no death is going to happen. Jesus dies on the cross, offers you that blood covering, that you can be covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so that when death comes eternally, separation from God, it will pass by you. Why? Because you are covered in the blood of Jesus. You're covered by his righteousness. That's the Passover. You can clap right there. Yeah, yeah. So he dies, gets beat, gets mocked, gets spit on, gets ridiculed, gets hung on a cross, a sign above his head, a spear in his side, dead. Now, if he had stayed dead, we wouldn't have a savior. Here's why we wouldn't have a savior. Because he'd be just another good man who died. No proof that he has any power over death. No proof that he can give you eternal life. He's just a dead man who said, I'll cover your sins. And we just hope one day when we get there that he actually did it. No, he comes back from the dead. He comes back and witnesses to over 500 people over a 40-day period. I'm alive again. Why? Because I have the power over death. I can give you then the same thing I have, which is eternal life. And in that death and that resurrection, he accomplishes two things. He covers your sin and he gives you righteousness. Maybe you've never seen this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. I need my sin covered and I need his righteousness to be in the glory of God. So I have to have his resurrection in order to be in the glory of God, in order to have an eternal life, because I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and he offers me both of those things. There are words that are used about his crucifixion. I want to explain them to you so you get it. One of the big words in theology is propitiation. What is propitiation? It means if Brandon owes me $20, Brandon's debt is not paid off when he gives me $10. Brandon's debt is paid off when he gives me $20, he has given me the propitiation of the loan. Jesus' death was a propitiation for your sin. He covered it all. He covered it all. He covered it all. He covered it all. Why is that important? Because you lead someone to Christ and you tell them that he died to cover your sin and they think that the next day if I sin, I'm not covered. He covered it all. It was the propitiation for Todd Mazingo's life. How do I know that? He died 2,000 years before I committed a sin. He had Todd Mazingo's life covered. If I would accept what he did for me, I would get that covering for my life. Does that mean I can continue in sin so that I get covered by the grace? No. Paul says, why in the world would you think that way? He died for your sin. Why would I want to go on committing sin? I want to be right. I want to be sanctified. I want to be purified. I want to walk in his ways. I don't want to continue in sin. That's death. It's garbage. He's a savior. What does he save you from? An eternity separated from God. That would be hell. He saved you from death by giving you life so that you can be with God and not separated from God for an eternity. He is your redeemer. What does it mean he's a redeemer? It means he bought you back. When you use a coupon at the store, you're giving them a coupon for a value. Jesus bought with his life the value of your life. He redeems it back to God. He has purchased you back. He is your redeemer. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Listen, uh, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, this is after he's resurrected, all authority has been given to me where? Where? Okay, so he already always had authority in heaven. Am I correct? So now he's saying, I have authority on earth. Why? Because Satan has it. But once I come and don't sin and go pay the penalty for you, I get that authority back from him. I get the dominion back over the earth. So Jesus says, he doesn't have the rule anymore. I have the rule. I have the authority. You don't have to be afraid. Look at me. You don't have to be afraid of the demonic. You have authority over the demonic. 
in Jesus' name. And if you don't understand how that works, I need you to go to court. I need you to go into the courtroom now. Why? Because when you go into the courtroom, you go with a representative called a lawyer. The lawyer goes in there to speak for you. Am I correct? You don't stand up because you're afraid you'll make a mistake and you'll get fined and sentenced and whatever. So you send the representative in and you say, you represent me. So whatever deal you make, whatever you're willing to go for, whatever you think is right, whatever needs to be said, you do that and I'll back you up because you're my lawyer. In other words, he's gone in there in Todd Mazingo's name. He represents what I want. He represents the deal I want to make. I tell him this is what I want to do. Go in there and try to make that happen for me. And Jesus says, you now have authority in my name. You go into the courtroom and you represent me. This is what I want. Now go in there and get it. You have my authority. So we're representing Jesus and we are sealed by God. What does that mean? What does that mean I'm sealed by God? Because God says that when you understand that Jesus died to cover your sins, he rose to give you righteousness and right standing with me, you now have authority in the earth in Jesus' name. You are no longer a victim, you are a victor. You can walk forward in this. And by the way, Jesus says, oh, Jesus is the one who said, I am going to sit at the right hand of the Father Pull out your book, John 16. And I am sending you a helper, one who will guide you into all truth, one who will convict of sin and righteousness and judgment, one who will be with you always. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes for the purpose of walking out this Christian life with me. Ephesians 4.30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When I come to know Christ as my Savior, I accept the fact that he took my sins and he gave me a righteousness. I get a stamp on my forehead. It says, Holy Spirit. It says you are sealed for the day of redemption. You now have the seal that says you are saved. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God and you are not your own? Listen, in the Old Testament there is a temple that God dwells in. He lives in the Holy of Holies. He meets with them there once a year for atonement for everybody. He's behind the veil. He's behind the veil. God in the Old Testament is behind the veil. He's there amongst them, but he's in that room behind that veil. Then Jesus comes. And Jesus gets crucified on a cross. What happens at the temple The foundation splits and the curtain splits from top to bottom. Saying what? That we now have access to the Holy of Holies? No. No. It says that when it went from top to bottom, God through his spirit came out to dwell in you because you're now the temple, not that building with the veil. You go into Corinthians. You go into the book of the Corinthians and it says when you come to know Christ, God removes the veil so that I can now see clear. Remember this from glory to glory statement? That's what he's talking about. The old glory is God behind the veil in the temple. The new glory is God in you without a veil. Okay. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own initiative. Please don't miss that. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit's job is to talk to you about what God is saying for you. He is the download instrument. He is the one that seeks the deep things of God for you and brings them to you. If you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, you're not getting what God has for you. It's a miserable life because you walk through trying to figure out what to do when God is saying, go, go right, go right, go right, go right. I'm not sure which way to go, God. What should I do? Go right, go right, go right. I don't know. There's a voice in my head, but I think it's just me, God. Go right, go right, go right. Uh, Is that me or is that you? I can't really tell. Go right, go right. Listen, go right. Go right. Trust the voice. The only way you're going to learn is that the Holy Spirit or not is follow it and see if it comes out good. And if it does, you'll say, that's the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't come out, you'll go say, that was me. Uh, Okay, but listen. Or Satan. John 1, 33. He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him. This is the one 
who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Don't have time to teach it today, but i got to let you understand the concept. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit dwells in you. You are the host of the Spirit of the Almighty God. You are walking around with His presence. John chapter 20, Jesus comes and meets with the apostles, meets with those disciples and says, peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, when Jesus has returned from the dead, he is saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Then he says, go to Jerusalem and wait there until the Spirit comes upon you in power. Wait a minute, I've already got the Spirit. No, you got to go see Him come upon you in power. you got to know what it means for the Spirit to come upon you to be baptized in the Spirit so that I can do the things that God has called me to do. I get a boldness. I get a strength. I may get prophecy. I may get tongues. I get something because He baptizes me in the Spirit after I've been sealed and indwelled with the Spirit. I can be baptized in the Spirit in order to... Wow, you guys are like, sure? Are you sure about that? <laughs> It'll change your entire theology if you go read John chapter 20. Because there they already had the Holy Spirit. Then when he says, go to Jerusalem and the Spirit's going to come upon you with power, you're asking the question, what does he mean upon them with power if they've already got it? Because he can come upon you with power. Mm. Now, here's what happens. I have gone from a place where I was disobedient to God. My walk, my life is... Listen... All have sinned. Is there anybody in here who hasn't sinned? I need to worship you. (laughs) Guess not. Every one of us can come up with that. Every one of us know we've sinned. Listen, for Adam and Eve, they ate a piece of fruit. And it separated them from God. I'm thinking if that's the worst thing I've ever done, I'm good with God, right? No. He had to put them out of the garden. Why? Because it was disobedience. Because disobedience is disobedience. And we've all been disobedient. We know that. All of us have sinned. So now that I've sinned and I've separated myself from God, what do I do about that? God says, I sent Jesus to the earth. He died on a cross. He made a sacrifice. You can transfer your sin onto him. He will die. He will be separated from me. He will be punished for your sin. But then he will come back from the dead to prove to you that he can give you an eternal life if you'll believe in that process. That's the gospel. The good news is that Jesus will take my punishment for me and make me right with God. That's the basic core of the gospel. It's not say this prayer. It's not just, I told you guys once before, I was dealing with a seven-year-old trying to explain the gospel after someone else had, and the seven-year-old says to me, I was going to ask Jesus in my heart, but I was afraid he'd be too big and I would bleed. (laughs) Here's my point. If we don't understand what's actually going on, it becomes more difficult to explain. And when we use these catchphrases that we've learned, they don't really understand what we're asking. What we're asking is for them to admit, I've done wrong in front of God. But Jesus has died, and if I believe in what he did and that he did it for me, and I believe that he rose from the dead, then I have right standing with God. I have the blood covering. I'm righteous with him. I can walk forward. My sins aren't accounted against me, Scripture says. Do I want to sin? No, I don't. I want to walk in a way that's pleasing and honorable and sanctified. So here's my question this morning. Before this maniac ranted and raved around the stage, (laughs) did you understand the gospel? What if the rabbi's right? And on the 12th of next month, Jesus comes back on that horse with King of Kings, Lord of Lords, ready to take his own. And you're sitting back saying, I hope I was saved. I think I was saved. 1 John. And I am totally shooting from the hip because I am horrible with addresses, but I know it's in 1 John. 1 John 5. Yeah, 1 John 5. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written. What has he written? That you believe in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this. God has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. Verse 10 and 11. You see what he said? 
He said, believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son and he who has the son has life and he who does not have the son does not have life. That's these things. These things are salvation is only found in his son in what his son did for you. These things, watch, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of son of God so that you may what? No. Know so that you may know you have eternal life. From eight, when I walked an aisle to get baptized to keep, going to keep from going to hell, until I was 20, I hoped I was saved. I hoped I was saved because I walked an aisle. At 20 years old, I finally understood the gospel. He died for me. He took my punishment on himself. He was crucified and separated from God. He came back to prove to me he's got the power over death and he can give me eternal life because he's going back to sit with God and sending me the spirit. This guy's got it. At 20, I finally understood the gospel and I accepted what Christ had done for me. And now I know I'm saved. That's not an arrogant statement. He said, if you understand, there will be fruit produced. This is where we get really, really honest because I believe the time is short. I don't have many more opportunities, I don't think, to share the gospel. I want to do it today in a way that we stop playing Christian games, that we stop playing let's be good people, that we stop saying I go to church so surely I'm saved, uh, that we stop saying I pray, I read the Bible, I'm a good person, I've done more good than bad so God's going to love me. Listen, it just takes one one sin to be separated from God. You need Jesus for that one sin. So if you've ever had one sin, you need Jesus to die for you. You need to believe in that. You need to believe that he was raised so that you could have that righteous covering. I'm asking you right now, right now, do you know that you have accepted his death for you and are covered by his righteousness so that if you have to stand before God, listen, I've got my speech prepared. Here's my speech before God. No, I'm not worthy. But Jesus died to take care of every unworthy thing I did. I've got his covering. And I believe God's going to say, you understand. Enter. Enter into the salvation. Enter into your eternity.